answer this now kind of scripted because I, I've gotten this question a lot from people when I first introduced myself. You know, I'm Puerto Rican, but my father, he enlisted in the Navy in Puerto Rico. And as a result of that, we, we moved from Puerto Rico to Virginia where he was stationed. And I moved there when I was four years old. And, you know, I've really lived in Virginia up until I moved here in 2016. So I've spent the majority of my life uh, in Virginia. This interview now probably would be different if, we, if, if, if it was maybe five years ago, because uh, I've had the time now after, you know, living here in Louisiana for a bit to kind of uh, take a step back and really put my upbringing into perspective a little bit more and sort of reflect on my upbringing. When I reflect on that, there's a lot of comparisons to help bring out that upbringing. So I like to compare with, you know, how my parents were raised in Puerto Rico, with what I see now in Louisiana. I was raised in Virginia Beach, Virginia. It's part of Southeast Virginia. That part of Virginia, they call it the seven cities since there's seven large cities that make up Southeast Virginia or what they also call Hampton Roads. It's a military town, but, you know, obviously because of size, it's, it's far from a town. It's home to the largest naval base in the world. Um, so I like to just let that for folks just sink in a little bit. You know, the largest naval base in the world. And that sort of helps you understand why Southeast Virginia is, is such a military town and also why it's so heavily populated to the point to where you can have seven cities make up uh, Southeast Virginia. Uh, so, you know, the military obviously fuels the economy there. And so naturally, culturally, that's uh, part of living in Southeast Virginia is, is the living in this military culture. What does that mean? You know, it's living where, uh, it's not uncommon to hear jets flying overhead at all times of the day. You know, it's funny um, living here. Uh, my wife always uh, tends to comment that, you know, she's around coworkers who, you know, you hear a plane go by and they're like, oh my God, what was that? What is that? What is that? Um, and I'm, you know, we're just so used to it. You know, there's bumper stickers that say, I love jet noise, for example. Uh, that's just, you know, how, how, how big the military is there. Even in reflecting, comparing Baton Rouge to Virginia Beach, Virginia Beach, you know, I grew up in one of the safest cities in the United States. And it was hard for me to put that in perspective until I moved here. And, you know, as a criminologist and looking at statistics, and one thing I do in class when I teach criminology is kind of just point out, you know, homicide rates across the United States and break that down by states and even cities. And so to really bring it home, I show students sort of what the statistics say about the crime rate here in Louisiana, Baton Rouge, and uh, other neighboring cities. Um, and even comparing to cities across the US and it's like, bam, there's Virginia Beach, one of the safest cities in the, in the United States. And here sort of at the top of the list in terms of not so safe are cities such as uh, New Orleans and Baton Rouge. And, um, and so coming here kind of just like hit me like, wow, like I didn't really know how privileged I was to live in a city where, you know, we didn't have to worry so much about our safety, about crime. Um, and then there's things like uh, education. I grew up in, a, in an area where uh, fortunately, like we had a really great public school system, tremendous resources thrown at our public school systems. And so again, that's moving here and seeing sort of the, the barriers to giving uh, kids here uh, quality resources in their public schools. And, you know, I'm sort of recognizing like, wow, like I had a really great education growing up that was public. 
you know, so yeah, again, that's why, again, I, I put things in perspective. Um, and, and even things like small things like roads, like I, I took for granted how, how well I, I uh, enjoyed paved roads until I moved here. You know, there's something about just like moving or living in different areas that just open your eyes to, uh, you know, what you have had, what you don't have, what other people have, what they don't have, you know, how cultures manifest themselves in different ways. And, and so my upbringing also is a reflection of being also a Puerto Rican. So, so my father being in the Navy, he was obviously more fluent in English. And so moving to Virginia, we were, or at least my parents took the side of raising my brother and I to get as quickly adjusted to living in the States as possible, which meant uh, ensuring that we could pick up on English quickly. I was raised heavily in English uh, as a kid. My parents raised me so that so that my brother and I could speak English fluently. So my parents didn't force uh, my brother and I to speak Spanish. And this is somewhat cultural if you uh, look up Puerto Rican upbringing patterns, especially for those who move to the United States. It's either one or the other. You typically have parents who continue to have their kids speak Spanish, or you have uh, parents who want their kids to speak English only. And my parents took that English only side uh, of things or approach, I should say. Maybe because, you know, they were so new to the States, you know, they didn't have any family here. It was just them, not to mention my brother and I. I think that explains a lot in terms of them also kind of being a little bit more protective of my brother and I you know, seeing kids go out and play just freely. Like I didn't really have that experience, you know, and part of that too is the, the language stuff. So, you know, my mother was a stay at home mom working full time as a mom. And, you know, if something were to happen to my brother and I, and my dad's at work, like she doesn't know English well enough to, you know, explain to, you know, uh, the cops what's what happened or something. So she always had that anxiety about, you know, having to, you know, speak English at a time when, um, you know, maybe unfortunately something would happen to us. So, you know, that played a role in terms of how we were brought up, you know, uh, make sure you're, if you play outside, you're in, 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 in a distance where we can see, you, right. Things that I really didn't understand until like just recently, right. Your parents was like, you'll understand one day. Like, yeah, I get it now. As much as, you know, I wanted to, uh, you know, disagree growing up with, you know, Oh, let me let me go here or there it's you know now I, I kind of understand it so and uh, I don't fault them at all for it because um, you know it's it's um, again like you're you're in a new new you might as well call it a new world you know and if all of you know is you know if you don't have any friends you don't have any family around then it could be quite a, a, a fearful experience um, it would be harder to just jump right in um, so, you know, my upbringing was very reflective of, you know, uh, my parents being new here. And then, you know, there's the whole, um, my, my, I think because it was a military town, I was, and also because I played sports, you know, I was around kids who, from all walks of life, you know, Filipinos, Mexicans, honestly, very little Puerto Ricans. Uh, African Americans, white kids, you know, my high school was like 30% white, 30% black, 30% Asian. So I, you know, I grew up in a very diverse, um, I would say environment. And, you know, I, I also, that's something that also I look back on as, as very unique to my experience because not everybody has that um, ability to, to live somewhere where, you know, you have such diversity. But we know that, you know, the military has that ability to bring that out. So, you know, I was also in a, in a, in a place where yeah, I could have these, uh, you know, I could go to my friend's house and eat ponset, which is like a Filipino dish. 
And, you know, I miss it right now. Like I miss my Filipino friends going to their houses and like eating their food. <laughs> I had some great experiences um, just in terms of meeting people from all walks of life, uh, being in Virginia, in Virginia Beach. But, you know, there was also a core of me that the only thing that tied me to Puerto Rico was my parents. You know, they did speak to me in Spanish often, so I was able to pick up on the language. And I could have some very basic conversations, personal conversations in Spanish, but if we were to have this interview in Spanish, I couldn't do it. All I knew about Puerto Rico was like, the food was something that, that really tied me to being Puerto Rican. You know, my mother would always cook Puerto Rican food. And that's something, again, like now it's like, oh man, just like I miss, miss coming home and you know, there's mom cooking rice and beans. But, you know, I'm fortunate because, you know, my, my wife, um, who's actually white, she, she is just like full blown, just like immersed herself in understanding and wanting to know more about Puerto Rican culture that she, you know, will frequently just uh, bug my mom for recipes. And so she's, she's actually um, able, to, she's able to make a ton of Puerto Rican dish along uh, with myself. So we're able to sort of maintain that that part of my identity through food. And, you know, I, as a kid, I was able to go back to Puerto Rico here and there, but not often. And again, like I said, there was, there's not, there was not many Puerto Ricans living in uh, Virginia beach either. So, you know, I didn't really have Puerto Rican friends or anything. Most of my friends were white or black uh, or Filipino. You know, I didn't have my first sort of friendship with a Puerto Rican until college. Um, he was my, my roommate. Uh, but he was also somebody who, he was actually born in Connecticut. His parents were Puerto Rican um, or are Puerto Rican. So, you know, we were sort of similar in that way in terms of, you know, being raised in, in the States. But then I ha always had that sort of part of me uh, missing was more of uh, friendships and social uh, ties to Hispanics and Latinos which I really didn't get until I came here to Louisiana. So that was, a, that was unique to my experience here. And we can touch on that later. But, um, you know, I'd say that my upbringing was, is unique in terms of that somebody being, you know, born outside of the United States, outside of the States, from somewhere that speaks a different language, move here. And now parents are having to adjust to having to raise a child that has to adjust to living here and they don't even know what the culture is like here either so i'm very sure that they were just beyond scared for my brother and i but they they did an amazing job um but then i i had to obviously find my own way um given in in, in terms of having this identity that's you know, I'm Puerto Rican, but here I am living in obviously predominantly white spaces, but, you know, having to adjust to that culture. Um, and, and so on all that that, you know, brings. So again, that idea of being, you know, uh, I've got to got to adjust to living like an American while also maintaining this Hispanic side of me. And it's sometimes they can push you and pull you. Sometimes they don't mesh well. Sometimes they do. And, you know, sometimes it just depends on where you are that, you know, obviously what, what, what kind of identity is coming out now. So, yeah, I, I'd say that that's been my upbringing for the most part down there. So I got my bachelor's and my master's degree at an HBCU in Norfolk, Virginia, which is part of those seven cities, um, Norfolk State University. You have my bachelor's in sociology, my master's in criminal justice. And I've kind of had this goal of like many students in criminology or criminal justice courses who have these dreams of working for the FBI. Uh, I was one of those kids. Um, so, you know, I kind of hit a point to where I was, I was closing or finishing up my master's and I kind of had to make a decision um, because I had applied for some of those federal positions, but I was turned away because many of them said that I needed to um, have some experience 
um, either in the military or in law enforcement. And I didn't want to get my PhD um, at that time because I was just done with school. It's like, man, six years, this is enough of school for right now. Like, I, I want to make some money now. You know, I decided to become a police officer. I was a police officer in Norfolk, Virginia for about uh, three years. And just to make a long story short, I, I stopped after three years and decided to pursue my PhD uh, in sociology at Virginia Tech. And that was actually, in the short story, that was actually the first and only school I applied to for a PhD program. Kind of just applied on a whim and was just crossing my fingers to see if I would get in. If I didn't, I would just you know, keep being a cop for the time being. But they accepted me, and so I decided that um, I would go get my PhD. So I went to Virginia Tech, which is in the southwestern part of Virginia, you know, right there in the Appalachian Mountains, Blacksburg, Virginia. Uh, it's 45 minutes from Roanoke, which is sort of the nearest bigger city. If you, and it's hard to even call Roanoke a bigger city. That's sort of mountain living. It's beautiful. And that was quite different from Virginia Beach where I was raised. And, you know, I was, I lived 10, 15 minutes away from a beach. So right now in the summertime, I'd actually be on a beach right now, <laughs> which I miss, of course, uh, having that, that luxury of just having a beach right there. I miss that so much. But, you know, spending four years in the mountains in kind of like a secluded small college town. And it's kind of that stereotypical college town where, you know, when school's in session, the town is booming. When school's not in session, it's just a ghost town because without the, uh, it's just a population of about 40,000 people um, there in Blacksburg. So it's, it's, it's a small town, uh, but just absolutely gorgeous because there's mountains everywhere. So I had kind of, you know, that part of my life was kind of just like this, this period to kind of just like step away from uh, the fast paced life that was, you know, consuming me there in Virginia Beach and Seven Cities, uh, sit down and just focus on studies for four years, get my PhD. I, you know, I fell in love with the mountains. I also, you know, I can miss the mountains right now. But, you know, so I got my PhD in four years. And, and that was in 2016 when I graduated. And then that's what brought me to Louisiana. So um, I hit the job market fall 2015, got accepted for the position. Um, and then I came here in the summer of 2016. So uh, that was right when, you know, we had Alton Sterling uh, happen, death of Alton Sterling. And then the, the shooting of the officers, not you know, nearly a month afterwards, and then the the great flood, and then sometimes we, we sprinkle in there, also Mike the tiger died, <laughs> and then Les Miles got fired. So, <laughs> but uh, so yeah, I moved here summer 2016, and so the, the the position at LSU as a professor in the Department of Sociology is what brought me to uh, Louisiana. <laughs> You know, for me, it, it's it's really no different than, you know, somebody being raised in Louisiana and, and feeling like they're different from somebody raised in Virginia, too, right? So just in terms of, you know, the culture, you know, it's just distinct, you know, language itself. You know, we can start there. You know, Spanish is the, the dominant language in Puerto Rico. It's not in the U.S., but then you have every other kind of different distinction, you know. Puerto Rico is also, it's, it's, it's a, has a rich history of colonization. You know, the Spanish colonized it. And, and so that's also a part of, you know, unfortunately who I am is that's part of my history is, is colonization. You know, if I were to, you know, I've done my sort of ancestry.com thing and, you know, I've got ancestry from Spain, Portugal, the indigenous in Puerto Rico also, and uh, I've got uh, ancestry from, from Africa which is just like, okay, so my blood is the, the history of, 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 of slavery. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not, that's, that's, it's part of Puerto Rico. And so, um, and so that's just a part of me too then, right? I like to make that distinction just because, you know, again, culturally there's distinctions, you know, in language, there's food, right? Although, I, you know, when people say explain Puerto Rican food, there is almost a sense of, uh, you can almost com quite draw some comparisons to Louisiana food there, but it also has a lot to do with, again, uh, slavery, you know, so, uh, you know, we eat a lot of rice, we eat a lot of beans, 
plantains is huge, um, but just foods that were brought to the island as a result of, of, of slavery, but also mixed in with some of that indigenous cooking. And then, you know, it, culturally, we know, music, you know, I, you know, I like to think music is a big part of my life in, in, in terms of also making the distinction or also explaining my upbringing, you know, I, uh, my parents on Sundays would always be playing salsa music. And so that was also a, a way to sort of, for me to help gain attachment to that Puerto Rican identity was through music, right? Or television, you know, my mom would always be watching, you know, the telenovelas uh, on TV. So uh, there, was, there was aspects that were of my life where I was able to connect with that Puerto Rican identity. But then there was also this other side to where it was pulled to uh, more of the being what we say Americanized, right? So, you know, I could pick up on a more American style music uh, growing up. So my musical tastes are just crazy broad. Uh, and I think that's just a lot to do with, you know, my, my upbringing really. Um, so, um, you know, even it's so, so, you know, in, in high school, again, because it was so diverse, you know, hanging out with friends who would put me on to hip hop or hanging out with friends who would put me on to b-boy dancing or the car scenes, um, you know, things that just aren't big in, in, in parts of Puerto Rican identity, but like, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the cultures of, of different other, of other peoples. And it's like, all right, well, I'll soak that up. I'll soak that up. I'll soak that up. Um, so I've been kind of a sponge throughout my life, I, I'd say. Uh, so that's, again, why I, I like to say that, you know, I, I make these distinctions in terms of my Puerto Rican identity um, and, uh, you know, this, this American identity. But, you know, there's also times when some of that gets challenged and makes things like kind of weird. But like when I introduce myself or I am introduced to somebody, for example, who is Hispanic or Latin American and he speaks Spanish, sometimes they'll sort of immediately start speaking Spanish and I'm just like, oh, whoa. And then my anxiety kind of kicks in because I'm, you know, I'm not fluent in Spanish. And sometimes there's just an assumption that if you're, you know, if you say you're from Puerto Rico or any other Spanish speaking country that you kind of automatically should be speaking Spanish. So for me, that's, you know, it's just not the case. Like for example, two weeks ago, I got an email from, from somebody who emailed me completely in Spanish and I was able to sort of take my time and translate it, but you know, I really couldn't respond back in Spanish other than a few little words to kind of communicate that, look, I, they wanted to actually have me as an invited speaker uh, for a conference in Mexico. Um, but the caveat was I needed to speak Spanish. So, you know, I very briefly had to just kind of communicate like, look, I, I can't do this. I don't speak Spanish fluently. So there's just that kind of sometimes that assumption that's put on, uh, on people with, you know, uh, Spanish speaking descent. And so, so I've had that experience at times that kind of, again, that kind of just challenges what it means to be you know, Puerto Rican uh, or from any other Spanish speaking country, you know, there's sometimes there's these, uh, uh, I see these discussions often on social media about, you know, people who uh, feel like their identity is under attack because people suggest, some people suggest that you know, you, you're not, for example, Puerto Rican if you don't speak Spanish, right? And, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's difficult um, because while it is, you know, the, the language of my people, I'm very comfortable now saying that, you know, I still, I still, I am Puerto Rican. Like, um, say what you want. I am Puerto Rican and I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that. Um, but again, we, we still have these sort of, I guess, identity challenges to our identities uh, out there. You know, I'm, I'm not immune to facing those, those challenges either.
guess I have to speak for me personally. It's not been difficult for me to actually have to reconcile with my, you know, being a, a police officer. And I don't think it should be any different than, say, for example, LSU as a university having to reconcile with, you know, maybe any of the racial injustices that it has done uh, as a university, right? And asking its professors to, or its staff to acknowledge maybe things that, you know, are contributing to injustices for minorities on campus, right? It's only with facing that that we're going to be able to uh, build, you know, a, a better uh, society, a better humanity. I didn't have much difficulty actually trying to understand why minorities might be frustrated at the police, right? You know, part of that too is, you know, I, I, I did have a small, I should say small, I did have a, a, some, a bit of training, educational training, even before I was a police officer that did talk about and acknowledge some of the, uh, you know, the racial disparities in the criminal justice system. So when I took uh, my criminal justice courses at Norfolk State University, many of those uh, courses included discussions about, about race uh, in the justice system. So, um, Going into law enforcement, I kind of had that background to understand that, um, you know, I could be in communities that are policed differently. And, and for me, you know, I, I, I practice the style of policing, community policing, which is pretty heavy in the discourse now as uh, a much talked about strategy for police to practice. I actually did practice it, even though uh, I'm comfortable saying that we don't really have a good idea of what community policing is. Um, and actually the research kind of says that's true. We have, we have an idea of what we know we want it to be, uh, but in practice, um, there's no sort of uniformity or standard of what it looks like. Um, for me, that really just meant um, having ownership over one community, specifically in public housing and um, being visible to the residents there as much as possible, them kind of getting to know me more on a first name basis, or actually really in in, in law enforcement, it's 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 just it's mostly just last names as a first name. So it's hey Torres, how you doing? You know that that sort of thing. You know residents calling me on my work cell phone. We had work cell phones um, to discuss any uh, issues that they might have. So really just um, the you know, we say protect and serve, but really owning that service side was um, very integral to the style of policing that I did. Being able to maintain a level of trust with the community was huge. And if our sergeant felt like we weren't able to, to keep that trust, you know, we were, we were gone from this unit that we were working in. It was a specialty unit uh, that we were in. So you know, there was a lot of responsibility to help maintain that trust. And, you know, we took that seriously. I took that seriously. Um, so, you know, I tell people this all the time, like I had a different experience as a cop because I, I practice a, a different style of policing than what people usually know. And so I'm very fortunate to uh, have done that kind of policing because again, you know, I was going to, I was invited by people in public housing to dinners, to birthday parties, and, you know, not every, not every cop gets to experience that. And that was very rewarding, you know, for, to, to, to have people in the community just kind of open their doors to me like that. Um, and, you know, I was policing mostly African-American public housing communities. I mean, statistically 98% of the residents there were African-American. Uh, the other 2%, uh, maybe, I can count on one hand the number of, of, of white people in, in the public housing communities that I policed. Uh, count on one hand the number of uh, Hispanic and Latino, uh, Latina uh, people in these communities. So, you know, uh, uh, the ability to police with professionalism is certainly possible. But at the same time, we also have to acknowledge that law enforcement can improve. And uh, that's part of that uh, reconciling with with your past and um you know your actions and, and so again for me it's 
it's not that difficult to to have that conversation about whether or not what I was doing was actually, you know, working to benefit the community if or not, uh, or have that discussion with myself to say that you know things could have been done different. Thing, things could have been done differently, right? Um, or can be done differently. Uh, obviously, as a scientist, uh, a social scientist, uh, we're big on using, you know, science to help guide change. And so there's a, a lot of uh, uh, benefit to having science help guide my understanding of, of a better way of, of doing things as well in terms of policing. Um, you know, I'm here soon, I'll be teaching, uh, I'm not sure when this, when this comes out, but in the fall semester, I'll be teaching race and policing, which will be, uh, I think the third or fourth time I've taught this course since coming to Louisiana. And that's kind of another outlet for me to have to confront that history of, of law enforcement. So, you know, I take a very direct approach uh, with that, that course um, by emphasizing the history of race and policing. So I did my due diligence in terms of wanting to know more about that history and confront that history uh, to understand how do we get here today. And that has actually helped me, maybe the right words, make sense of this moment that we're living in. Because, you know, in, in looking at the history, what we're seeing is like, this seems to have, ha seems to be happening almost every 50 years now. You know, we, we can talk about the 60s riots, um, where, you know, we had for nearly a decade, riots surrounding activities or actions done by the police that, you know, triggered protests, uh, triggered riots, you know, the longest period or the longest stretch was in 1967, maybe. I think it was called the Long Summer, um, where, you know, just had this long summer of just protests and riots. It was very similar to this summer right now. And that triggered, you know, the president, uh, Lyndon Johnson, to put together a commission to investigate, you know, what was going, what's going on with these protests and riots. And that led to the Kerner Commission report, which basically said that, you know, many of these uh, riots and protests were triggered by some action by the police, but, you know, really that was kind of just like a, a tipping point for the community and kind of um, unleashing their frustration about uh, more of the systemic injustices that they were feeling. So it was always much more about, much more than just the police, which is, you know, what we're seeing, what we see now, right? This is more than just a call to uh, make changes to law enforcement, which uh, again, uh, I'd say we, that needs to happen. Uh, there's, there's many issues with law enforcement. We can always improve, and we need to improve. Um, but, you know, it's much more than that as well. You know, uh, crime is not a cause, but it's a symptom. So, you know, acknowledging that there's, there's other ways to address crime than just throwing law enforcement at it, right? being able to sort of teach on the subject also has been quite enlightening uh, for me personally. Again, I, I really have had difficulty to have that uh, reconciliation other than to say it is just quite, it's different because you know, it's one thing to, to teach about that history, but we're, we're living in it now, right? So it's, it's like, I always try to bring that, make that aware to my students. It's like, you, you know, realize you are living in, quite a historical period as much as we do talk about the 60s realize like this is very much like the 60s understand your your presence in history right now because um, this is a, a part of historical time.